Hey guys, welcome back once again to another episode of the show. You know, back a few years ago when I did my Faithful Findings review, I thought, that's it, I'm done with Neil's movies. There's no point of reviewing any more of them. But recently I watched this one and I just couldn't resist. So here we are, Pass Through, a movie about guns, tigers, and corruption. Oh my. So let's start off with the look at the poster, you guys know how I like to do that, might give us a good idea of what this movie is gonna be about. Now, right away, you'll notice that this poster is different from the ones from his previous films. Not only is Neil on the right side of the poster this time, but the whole thing is really just a graphic designer's worst nightmare. The whole thing is just cluttered with stuff. But let's take a look at this description. Artificial intelligence from far into the future arrives to immediately cleanse the human species of millions of humans who are harmful to other humans. A visionary, revolutionary film which pushes the human species to the limits of controversial, thought-provoking actions. Now, if any of this sounds kind of familiar, it's probably because Neil's done similar things before. He likes to do a lot of things over and over and over again. There's always a very overt message about how you know, corruption is bad, and or you know how we should be taking better care of the planet. Neil is always the hero in his movies, with little to no faults. He's either a secret agent computer hacker who swims naked with beautiful women in public pools, some kind of an alien god who controls everything and ends up saving and sleeping with young women, a successful author who at the same time is the world's greatest computer hacker who is constantly being pursued by young women, and also has supernatural powers which help him save and sleep with a young woman who, according to the story, should be the same age as him, but totally isn't. And in this case, he is a form of artificial intelligence from the future, but you'll have to wait until later in the video to find out if he ends up saving young women. You can probably guess. I have to say, Pass Through is actually Neil's, in my opinion, worst movie. I know some of you might find that hard to believe, but at least Fateful Findings had some variety in it to keep your attention. As ridiculous as it all was, that's kind of what made it entertaining to a degree, watching all these random things be presented to you as some kind of story. And as incoherent as it was, at least things happened. I can't believe you committed suicide. I cannot believe you committed suicide. How could you have done this? How could you have committed suicide? But with this, there's not a whole lot that really happens. Most of the time I had no idea really what was going on or what the movie was leading to. Uh, at one point I had a friend who messaged me and they were watching the movie at the same time. They said, what part are you at? And I, I realized I had no idea how to answer that question. Oh yeah, I'm at the part where Neil's just kind of walking around the desert. Happens multiple times throughout the movie. Yeah, now I'm at the part where he's just sitting on some rocks. Okay, now there's a tiger. Now he's just spinning around. Uh, I have no idea what this has to do with the actual story, but this is what I'm looking at right now. The movie starts with shots of the desert and right away we're gonna be introduced to the terrible editing. Just watch this cut. You may notice the tiger fading in and this tiger is going to show up multiple times throughout this movie. No idea what it means or what the point of it is. Neil's character is basically a heroin junkie living in the desert cleaning up his home. And here comes another bad cut as Neil goes from lying inside the camper to outside amongst the garbage. I, I thought he just cleaned this all up. Anyways, this smuggler tells him to clean this place up so that the border patrol doesn't spot them and gives him heroin as payment. And I just don't really understand why the garbage would be the thing to be concerned about in terms of giving away your position to the border patrol. Like, why would that set off any red flags? Like, the, the border patrol's looking and they see all these, oh yeah, there's a single file line of a bunch of people carrying jugs of water, guys with guns. It could be nothing, but uh, wait a second. Is that an empty yogurt container? Tom? Tom? Tom, get the trucks. Neil is supposed to be injecting the heroin here, but really just ends up spraying water on his arm. So he dies, and I guess this is when he gets possessed by the artificial intelligence from the future. There's something going on here with this. 
I don't know, gangs smuggling in these people from across the border and then killing them. You two are of no value to me on the streets. I'm all he's got in the world. Grandma, why'd you shoot her? Because I have absolutely no value for you two on the streets. Everything is pretty much what you would come to expect from a Neil Breen movie, especially in terms of visual effects. I want you, you too! Let's get out of here now! And writing and acting and editing and pretty much everything, really. But Now, I know I said this in the I Am Here Now video, uh, there's an interview where Neil said that he hires professional actors, and I'm sorry, you may be paying these people to be in the movie, but you are never going to convince me that these people are, are making a living off of this acting. Why are we running? We have to keep running. Your mother's my sister. She was murdered. I swear to God, I take care of you. You're my niece! We have to keep running! I mean, why is she asking, why are they running? How about the guy in the last shot firing a gun at you? Is that not a good enough reason? But get a load of this. In the very next shot, they're getting loaded into a truck and hauled off with the others. And then the next time we see them, they're still running in the desert. Anyways, there's a bunch of boring shots of Neil in the desert walking around. A tiger appears, touches some rocks. There's a shot of him with the tiger. Probably should have erased the snow in the background here because, well, that doesn't add up at all. So the smugglers take all the immigrants and keep them in some house. I guess they feed them beans and toilet paper. And I get it, you know, beans, canned beans are cheap, but... You're all eating beans in a small, confined space all the time. Really, you're just, you're just harming yourselves here. You belong to me. You ran away and tried to escape, and now you are mine. See, this person isn't acting. They're just shouting. Who the hell are you? What the hell are you doing in my house? This is my universe! I will kill you! You are done! Amanda and Kim stumble upon Neil's camper, and none of this makes any sense, because then it just cuts to them already talking. Not meeting or anything like that, just mid-conversation. Neil already knows everything about them. I'll let you and your niece stay in my place. I'll stay in the car up front. No, no, we can't stay here. It'll be fine. No, I'll clean it up. No Don't way worry in hell about we it. can stay here. No. Yes, he'll clean it up. I'm sure it will look as good as new in no time. Oh my God, what are you doing? It's clean. It's all clean. Now that is a face you can trust. He said he would clean it up, and he did. Now, you know, you and your niece don't have to worry about empty cans as you sleep soundly on that disease-soaked mattress. And Amanda is yelling at Neil, and I really don't know why. Here, drink some water. We'll get it ourselves. Leave us alone! And I just don't understand this. Like, you don't have to stay here. This person is kindly offering you a roof over your head and a partial mattress. That's, you know, you should be thankful for what you do have. Better than nothing. You could, you could have ended up with the others in the fart room. You know? But no, you're here. A place with the breeze. And that's all there is to the scene. All we get are just these fragments of interaction. Just look at this. They arrive on Neil's campsite. Then it's him convincing her to stay. And now it's her yelling at him about finding their own water. And furthermore, what else do we have here? Neil disappearing into a rock. Uh, the immigrants fighting very awkwardly over water. We also have Neil walking around the desert. More fighting. This time it's over sleeping. Neil is sitting on some rocks. 
Like, these aren't actual scenes. There's no building the story or developing character or moving the plot forward, and it's definitely not captivating. Kim follows Neil and sees him disappear into a rock, and why is he doing this? I don't know. I don't understand what is actually happening. And then Kim falls asleep for some reason. Then we have some more of Neil in the desert. And when he gets back, Kim starts questioning him about what he was doing. And it's like, okay, go oh, good. We're gonna finally get some answers here. Where did you go a little while ago? I went for a walk. I saw you. You're a weird dude. You're a weird dude? You see someone literally disappear into a rock before your very eyes, and your response to that is, you're a weird dude. Anyways, Neil runs into Amanda, who is even meaner than before. Don't come near me. I'll kill you, you fucker. I won't hurt you. I won't. Again, what is the problem here? This person has done nothing except offer to help you. I understand keeping your guard up, but it's not like he was trying to bull rush you. He didn't even know you were there. You were hiding behind a rock, waiting for him to get closer so that you could throw a rock at his face. Amanda looks remorseful, doesn't help him up or anything, but to her credit, she does try to help him after. But this interaction, it's, it's almost like someone trying to help a wounded animal. It's okay. It's okay. I'm sorry. No, just let me tap it a little bit, get the blood off. See? I'm not gonna hurt you. Again, the editing here. There's this shot of Amanda talking about all the bad people coming across the border. And then it just cuts to this scene where they kind of have this bonding moment over towels with holes in them. Hey, how you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. So this is weird because there's nothing between this scene and the last shot of them to show any kind of passage of time for her to be like, oh, hey, how you doing? Well, you know, to the audience's knowledge, you guys were just talking. Again, what does this have to do with anything? And then we just have this shot of Neil sitting down and staring back at her, and her staring back at him. Nothing's happening. Who is this guy? I don't know. How about you guys have an actual interaction to develop you know, whatever this is between the characters? Okay, here we go. Finally something, right? He tells them his name is Till, but it's spelt T-H-G-I-L. And they tell him their names, and then he offers them water again. And that's it. We're back to him sitting on the fucking rocks again, standing in a circle of rocks, spinning. And this is weird, the camera holds on him for a bit. Then the music fades out as the camera pans away. And then the camera pans back and the music fades back in while he's still spinning. What's on your face? Oh, I, uh, I, I, I guess it's dirt. I think I slept on the ground last night in the dirt. Just riveting cinema, you know. That's the whole scene, by the way. It, it's just mind blowing to think about being in the editing room. Like, well, that's, we, we can't cut that out. You know, we have to leave that in because otherwise the audience will be completely lost. They'll have no idea how he got the dirt on his face. You know, th there's no way they're just gonna assume that it's from him, you know, being dirty all over sleeping in filth, living in garbage. And then the movie has its own Troll 2 moment where Amanda realizes that Till's name is just light spelt backwards. Your name, Till. That isn't your name. That's light. L-I-G-H-T. Spelt backwards. Neil Bog. It's called the spell backwards! Have you seen the future? Okay, what kind of a thought process is that? How does that make any sense? Is there a deleted scene where she gets hit in the head by a rock? His name is Light, spelled backwards. 
Therefore, it's only logical that he's probably seen the future. And she goes on to ask if he's from outer space, and this is where Till explains about his ability to travel through time. This was all brought on because of a yogurt container. So this is where Till vows to eliminate millions of people, but only people that are harmful to other people. I will eliminate all of the people like you that have ruined this planet. You are done! No, you are done! I'm done! Done! I like the hesitation there too, you know? Uh, you are done! No, you are done! You done? You done! And I'm gonna, I'm gonna back out of the shot now so that uh, it makes the, uh, makes the effect just easier for the editor, you know, just if I back out of the frame. This seems like a good time to talk about how Neil writes dialogue, and not just with this movie, with all of his movies, because when it's not there to just force feed you exposition, it's the most unrealistic dialogue you'll ever hear in your life. We're constantly putting out our own corporate slanted news, half-truths, putting our own spin on it. We're just as biased and prejudiced in how we present the news as the public is. And it gets even worse. As Till is going through and eliminating all the bad people from Earth, he shows up at this mansion and makes these security guards disappear. Yeah, I guess they're really harmful people for just doing their job. And then just walks in and starts mingling with the people inside. As CEO of a major bank, we manipulate interest rates to serve our best interest. Oh, with no concern to the customers, of course. <laughs> they have no control over us. This also helps our stockbroker friends who manipulate their markets to the broker's advantage. We make a fortune at our insurance companies, overcharging customers and hospitals, and there's nothing the customer can do about it. We have the backing of the politicians. See, nobody talks like this. And to make it worse, none of this makes any sense. Like, Neil just walks in, and at no point is anybody like, uh, excuse me, who are you? And what are you doing here? How did you get in here? That never happens. This isn't a big party where he's just kind of blending in. There's a handful of people standing in each room, looking around awkwardly for some reason. I'm pretty sure someone would notice that he doesn't belong, especially since his only contribution seems to be shaming them. Isn't that corrupt? Isn't that cheating the public? Isn't that corrupt? Isn't that betraying the public's trust? Obviously this whole sequence was done with the background keyed out and these photographs of different rooms just placed in, but here's the funny thing. Sometimes when they cut between characters, the perspective of the background doesn't change. It literally stays the same. This isn't that hard. Obviously when you're going in for the close-up shots, you're just scaling up the background plate. So if you cut to a shot of a different character, just move the plate to the left or the right depending on where they're positioned. Who was that guy? I have no idea. Never seen him before. Who was that guy? I have no idea. He must not be from here. Yeah, I guess it's a good thing we continued to openly discuss our evil plans and corrupt business dealings with him around. So I guess instead of making them quietly disappear, he went for the more discreet method of just blowing up the whole house. And how did he do this exactly? Did he bring Evan along with him? I've been planting bombs. So again, we just see a bunch of the same kind of shit that's been filling out most of the movie to this point. Neil goes for a walk, spins around. I have no idea what in the hell this is supposed to be. And then here it is. Neil makes all the bad news anchors disappear and goes on a five minute rant about how bad people are bad and corruption is bad and the human species needs to be better to the planet. And it's not that I have a problem with this kind of message, it's just that Neil preaches this over and over again in all of his movies. Even look at Fateful Findings, a movie that seemed to be about a million different things, somehow ended on the note of exposing and getting rid of corruption. And when you look at this movie, in many ways it's the same thing as I Am Here Now. There's just somehow less that happens in this movie. So I guess I should mention that there's a subplot going on with these students and this professor who 
I guess, are trying to track down the signal from space or the future or whatever. Anyways, they track down the signal and freak out that it's here on Earth. And look how excited they are, especially this one. She's so pumped up, she just throws that book in the air. So they grab the professor who's sick and basically force him to come with them out into the desert so that they can... Um, I don't really know what the plan is. Like, find the signal. Dad, come with us. No, no, I'm just gonna stay here. It's just another one of your false alarms. I'm just gonna stay here and get some sleep. Yes, you kids just go off and wander into the desert with that sick old man. I'm just gonna hang out here. And then it just cuts to them standing in front of Neil, and somehow they've just come to the conclusion that he's the one they're looking for? It was you! All this time! It was you! Take me! They have absolutely no reason to think this. They came out into the desert earlier and saw him. Ah, some homeless bum. So if he was just some homeless bum before, why is he suddenly exactly who they were looking for? These are from where I come from. Now they'll believe you. <gasps> wow. <sighs> what? He just hands the kids some fake diamonds and tells them these are where I come from. So people are just going to believe him now? Why would the diamonds convince anybody of anything? Assuming they're supposed to be real, what is the kid supposed to do? Hey everybody, I met a form of artificial intelligence who traveled here from the future and took over the body of some heroin junkie in the desert. And if you still don't believe me, check these out. Yeah, that's right. Diamonds. Indisputable proof of everything I just said. Anyways, Kim just wanders off at some point. I don't know where Amanda was at the time. I mean, there's nothing else to do around here. So Amanda starts freaking out and of course needs the help of Till. And why does this hug last so long? Seriously, why is it so drawn out? Story-wise, of course. I mean, I think, I think we can all guess why it was drawn out during filming, but in terms of the story, you know, from a character perspective, if this is so urgent, then shouldn't you, you know, kind of get to finding your niece? Then blah, 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 they find her in some cave with a soldier who's living there who has PTSD, and of course, Neil saves him. He also saves the people that were killed in the beginning. Here's where Amanda's ex-husband shows up, and get yourselves ready for the performance of the year. You both are coming with me. You're the one I'm running from. Leave us alone! <laughs> Who the hell are you? Who the hell are you? Don't shoot. I bet you can guess what happens next. Yep, Neil brings the women back to life. And what the hell is this? I guess... This is indicating that they're now romantically involved somehow. Why? There's absolutely no reason for this here. In fact, there's really no reason for any of it in any of his movies. I am here now. She just has to have sex with the alien god before he leaves. Absolutely no logical reason for this to happen. No sexual attraction was ever developed in the movie. In fact, she didn't even meet him until the end. Fateful findings. A young woman tries to seduce him multiple times. No reason given for why she's just so insanely attracted to him. And on top of that, it has nothing to do with the plot. Now here's something I noticed on the credits, and I'm pretty sure Neil did this for Fateful Findings as well, but I didn't notice it until now. In the credits, you'll notice all these different companies listed for things like location, set design, lighting, you know, that sort of thing. Well, right under that, there's this disclaimer. Any of the above listed companies in the credits with an N or a B in their name are fictitious. This work was actually done personally by Neil Breen. Okay, so basically these companies are fake, and I guess this is Neil just using his initials to come up with different company names. That's actually kind of funny if you actually put his name in place of the initials. So all of these are just Neil. Casting and Entertainment, that would be Casting Neil Entertainment. Cine Neil Collaboration. Uh, what else do we got here? Lighting Neil Films. The Breen Neil Breen Effect Studio. Breen Breen Location Management. Neil 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 Entertainment Partners. Eats and Eats Film Incorporated. I guess that would be 
Eats Deal Eats Film Incorporated. BNN Salon, that would be the Breen Neal Neal Salon. Now, I'm pretty sure I've said this in videos before, but I might as well mention it again. I don't know Neil personally. I have nothing against him personally. Uh, and like any filmmaker, I hope that he continues to go out there and pursue making the films he wants to make. However, I, I wish I could say that I feel like he is progressing as a filmmaker and learning more about filmmaking throughout his career. Uh, but watching all of his movies and especially this one, if it's any indication, it's that he's getting worse, actually. Another thing I've noticed in Neil's films is that most of the characters, they're not really characters. They're more like vehicles for his ego. And I know that sounds mean. I'm Seriously, I'm not trying to be a dick, but just look at the characters. In the end, they're all really there to either pursue Neil, be saved by Neil, condemned by Neil or loved by Neil. And that is especially true in this movie. Every person in this movie is just a one dimensional character. There's no development or any kind of change. Just the bad people who are there for Neil to eliminate and the good people who are there for Neil to save. Basically, every one of these movies could be titled Neil Breen Saves the World. Now at the time of making this video, Neil has a new film coming out. It's not out yet, but I'd be willing to bet that a lot of the same reoccurring themes that I mentioned in this video will be in it. I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see. I don't know what I'm gonna be doing next. I know it's been a long time. A lot of stuff's been going on. It's always a long time between my videos. Um, it might be a long time between the next one, but that's maybe because I might take, take some time uh, to work on a bunch of videos and get them all done and then try and build up like a, I don't know, bank of videos to uh, release. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I'm still here, still doing the show. <laughs> so we'll see what comes up next. As usual, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. If I, if I just kind of leave the frame, was that, that'll probably make it easier for the editor, right? Just to seamlessly kind of fade the two. Otherwise, there's the shadow here, and he might have to use the pen tool and After Effects to kind of draw around that, that might be too much work. So I'll just, I'll just awkwardly back out of the frame. <laughs>